Welcome to a special edition of A Closer Look. I'm Mark Schein with my good friend Mark Miller. We are going to do a little bit special today because we're going to cover the end of the season, league champions, some things like that. We're going to go through our normal football fact and our where are they now type segments. But then we're going to, in our last segment, Mark, we're going to sit down and look at the tournament, where everybody's at in the UHSAA playoffs and preview some of those games as well. After last Friday night, have you dried out and warmed up? Because oh, that weather was man. as bad as it gets. Not until about yesterday, because I was out in it on Saturday and Sunday as well. So, well, in our, hoping for better weather this weekend. If you were a fan of the game last week, a player, a coach, an official, or some of our crew members, congratulations, that weather was as bad as it gets. Yep, it was terrible. Good job hanging in there. Our guys were awesome. They were awesome. Yes, they were. Well, Mark, let's get to our review okay. of league champions. You've got the first one. I got the WBL. St. Mary's is a champion, 9-0. and That is their first undefeated uh, record in the WBL since 1993. Elida and Wapak finished second yeah, at a 7-2 and two record. St. Mary's beat their rival Wapak in the last game, but they clinched a share in week number eight. St. Mary's led the league in scoring defense at 16.8 and scoring offense at 37.5. This team is built for bad weather, and here comes the bad weather in the playoffs. Okay, Mark, thank you for that. Let's move on. Let's look at the MAC championship, which was Marion local this year. The Flyers go 10-0 and 8-0 and in conference play. It's their 12th league championship for the Flyers. They outscored their opponents 308-69. to Mark, I try to track 57 teams in our area. They had uh, one of only two teams that gave up less than 100 points on the season. They gave up just 69 points. When you think they gave up 18 of those to Versailles and 10 to Fort Recovery, everybody else had a touchdown or less of the 57 teams that we covered. Best defensive team we've got around. St. Henry, they unfortunately lost to Fort Recovery the final week, 28-16. So that'll put Fort Recovery in the playoffs, but it also keeps St. Henry out. Other teams in the playoffs from the MAC and a Mary local, Coldwater, Fort Recovery, Delphi St. John's and Minster. They got six teams in and we'll preview those later on. Congratulations to the Flyers. Northwest Conference, Spencerville gets the championship, 7-0. They beat, uh, beat out Crestview and actually beat Crestview during the regular season, 49 to 34. Crestview finished at 6-1. They beat their rival, Delphus Jefferson, on the last game of the season to stop a three-year championship run for Jefferson. Now it's the Chris Summers four-year championship run as he got three at Jefferson, now one at Spencerville. They got healthy after a slow start, especially Chris Picker. Finished up with three touchdowns and 256 yards in that last game. After early stumbles, they won eight in a row to finish eight and two. I'm getting cold watching the rain in these oh. football games from last Friday night. Let's go to the BBC and Liberty Benton, who tied with McComb for the league championship. They were 9-1, and 7-1 and one were the Eagles. Uh, McComb ended up uh, with two losses, and one of those in conference play. Liberty Benton gave up just 95 points on the season. That's that other team, Mark, that had less than 100 points given up defensively. They scored 408 points. Uh, did the Eagles. The offensive player of the year is Austin May in the conference. He's the quarterback from Liberty Benton. The defensive player of the year, A.J. Dobbins, 132 tackles, 27 TFLs, three interceptions. He's also from Liberty Benton. The coach of the year, though, Chris Algie. He graduated all those guys from Macomb a year ago, came back this year with a pretty much a new crew and still managed to tie for league championship. Those teams are in the playoffs along with PG and Lipsick, and again, we'll preview them later on. Green Meadows Conference, the Hicksville Aces. I love the Aces. Oh, yeah. They finished at 7-0 undefeated. First championship for them since 2011, but the 11th overall. They had a great run in the 70s, won it every year for a while. Ran away with the league title. They started 0-2, another team that started 0-2 in those non-league games, then went 8-0 to finish 8-2. They host Gibsonburg in round number one of the playoffs. Moving on to the track where Toledo Whitmer goes 10-0, 7-0 in conference play. Their big win was over Toledo Central Catholic 21-14. That was in week six. Central Catholic had won the last four track championships and going 28-0 in conference play during that particular time period. Whitmer led by their sophomore quarterback, Riley Keller, averaged 37.6 points a game. They had eight points in which they scored at least 31 points to give up just 107. 24 of those were to Kent Glen Oak in the opener. Nobody else scored more than 14 against them. The big upset, Toledo St. John's upset Toledo Central Catholic last weekend, 13 to six. That puts St. John's in the playoffs for the first time since 2010, joining Whitmer and Toledo Central Catholic. NWCC, three playoffs teams, uh, playoff teams for that league. That's yep, good for them. It is. Sydney Lehman won it. They are seven and zero. Perry just a game back, six and one. Of course, they lost to to Lehman in the regular season. On Friday night, Lehman beat Riverside. 
Uh, they finished at 5-2. and two. Lehman led the league in scoring on offense, 40.9 per game, and defense, 13.2. That's a recurring theme, isn't it? It you is. You lead the league in offense and defense, you win the league, and that's yep. exactly what they did. All right, let's move to a couple of teams that, uh, first of all, one that's not in conference play, and that's Lima Central Catholic. After going 2-8 and eight in 2016, Scott Pulte's team goes 9-1 and one this year. Their only loss was to Delphi St. John's in week two when they scored only 10 points. In the other nine games, they averaged 38.7 points per game, led by Brendan Stolley, their quarterback, and Sean Thomas, a freshman running back, the first freshman in Lima Central Catholic history to score more than or rush for more than 1,000 yards. You can see him there on our video. Uh, they played six road games to the T-Birds. They also played six teams that made the playoffs. So kind of a tough schedule for them, and they are in at 9-1 this week. The other team we want to mention is Fort Laramie. Uh, they are in the playoffs as well under Whit Parks. They go 8-2, led by their quarterback, Austin Siegel. Uh, they were in the uh, new conference for them this year and uh, down the Cross County Conference. Uh, They're led in rushing by Michael Hoying and Carter Mesher. Uh, they lost to Minster early on. We'll preview their playoff game coming up with Fort Laramie. They make the playoffs as well. And Mark gets a quick rundown of all yep. the leagues and the teams that we dealt with yeah, yep. this year. Congratulations to the teams who won championships and to everybody who competed. Well, let's move on, Mark. This week's our fun football fact is... Well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we asked what NFL game was the highest scoring. Yeah. Now we're going to ask the opposite. What NFL game was the lowest scoring? And it's actually two games. Okay. And the score was the same in both games, obviously, two to zero. And it involved the same two teams, okay. the Packers and the Bears. One year, let's get it. 1932 at Wrigley Field. They oh, played yeah. football at Wrigley. That'd right. be kind of cool. The Packers, two, Bears, zero. In 1938, Bears two, Packers zero at Green Bay. So that is the lowest scoring. I don't know how you get any lower okay. than that. 2 0. This brings up a question. The Browns offense plays the Browns defense. Overtime. Overtime. <laughs> good, good point. All right. You also did some research for us this week on where are they now? You found a good one. Hey, let's look at Jason Stecksholdy. Jason's from Columbus Grove. He was an all state quarterback in 1998, also a really good basketball and baseball player. And then he went off to Angola, Indiana to Tri State, which is now Trine University. In 2002, he was an NAIA All-American defensive back when he left school. He was the all-time career leader in interceptions. He was a two-time captain, 3.54 GPA in civil engineering. He was a 2003 top senior male athlete at the university and has received a Distinguished Service Young Alumnus Award in 2011, inducted into the Hall of Fame. I think that's where that picture is. He's a, been a, a baseball umpire and a really good one for 15 years in this area. He works at Marathon Oil in Findlay, and that's where they are with Jason Stecksholdy. All right, Mark, thank you for doing a little research on that. And one more, because this question came up. If you are a quarterback, can you catch your own pass? Well, apparently to the rules. In high school and college, yes. In the pros, it has to be tipped. Right. And the first recorded tipped touchdown that a quarterback caught or a pass that a quarterback caught and ran for a touchdown was the Vikings quarterback Brad Johnson. I saw it on YouTube. They tipped it. He grabbed it. He ran in the end zone about five yards for a touchdown. But the most famous tipped pass was the Immaculate Reception. December 23, 1972, Terry Bradshaw is trying to throw a pass against the Oakland Raiders. The ball is tipped and into the arms of a trailing player who happens to be Franco Harris. You can see the Raiders were surprised that he caught it. He runs into the end zone for a touchdown. Steelers 13, Oakland 7 for the AFC Championship. And then we have a picture of current day after you see a slow-mo of Franco picking that thing off the, the turf there and running it in. You can see the Oakland players just stop. They think play's over, except for one guy's trying to trail. And that one guy, number 41 for the Oakland Raiders, is Phil Villapiano. And every year they get together in Pittsburgh to... Uh, kind of have a little reunion of the Immaculate Reception there on the far right. The gray-haired guy is Phil Villapiano, Bowling Green, Oakland Raiders, Buffalo Bills, and Franco Harris in the middle, the running back that caught the tip. They commemorate that every year, the Immaculate Reception. I can remember sitting in my living room yep. watching it. Did the, the, the Steelers and the Raiders have some wars? Oh, 
There, there, was, some there was some great, tremendous great, football yeah, games. Rivalries some, back then. Uh, all pro guys yeah. and Hall of Fame guys and Hall of Fame yeah. coaches and everything else. That was a yeah. great rivalry. Very cool. Well, we're into our first 10 minutes. We want to take a break now. When we come back after the break, we're going to look at each playoff team involved in our particular area, go through the brackets and take a look at them. You're watching High School Football on A Closer Look. Welcome back to A Closer Look. Mark Shine and Mark Miller. Mark, we want to take some time now. We want to look at the playoff brackets and kind of go through them from Division Two down through Division Seven. You open it up with Division Two. All right, there you see it up there. Division Two, Region Eight. Number five, Belmont at nine and zero is going to play what we consider a local team. Number four, Sydney at nine and one. Sydney lost only to Piqua, 37-33, and they got three big time players. Junior quarterback Andre Gordon. He's 6'2", 180. He really runs well, and boy, is he a great basketball player. Saw some YouTube highlights. Senior running back Isaiah Bowser, 6'1", 207. He packs a punch, runs over people, plays defensive back, over 2,400 yards rushing this season. And then the big boy, the senior defensive tackle, tight end. Even saw him try to throw a reverse pass. 6'2", 305, and he wears number one, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he plays basketball, too. He's got pretty yeah. good feet. They are a very good team. All right, Mark, let's go to Division Three as well, and you can cover those two. All right, Granville, number eight at eight and two. They're going to play at Bell Fountain, number one, nine and one. Bell Fountain lost to Sydney, 43-31. Their quarterback, Des Liberta, six foot 170. He is very fast, very elusive, and I'm going to tell you, he scrambles all over the field. If you don't believe it, just look at their Wapak game. He would scramble back 20, 30 yards and end up running for positive yards, and in one case, a touchdown. He is very, very tough to get a handle on. He likes to run it, which is good this time of year. There you go. And now here we're into Division uh, Three. This is Elida and Troutwood Madison from our area. That's right. Out of Division 12, number eight, Elida. They won that last game and still dropped a couple of spots. They finished at eight and two. They get to go to Troutwood Madison, 10 and 0, number one. They're the Division Three pole champs, the 2011 state champs. 2016 runner-up. They've been to the state semis seven years in a row. They average 52 points a game, and they play tough competition because seven teams from their league are in the playoffs. Four Division I, two Division II, and they are Division III. Elida's got that pass game with McAdams, Unruh, Harmon. They scored 17 points in Week 10 in the rain when they had been averaging 41 a game, so we'll have to see how weather affects that pass game. Trotwood's got the great running back, Ravion Hargrove. He is rested, and I say that because he had 1,600 yards, only 141 carries. So that means he is playoff ready. This is his time of year to shine. But you know what? Upsets happen every week, and Eli is going to go try to get one. All right, Mark, let's go on to Division Four right now in Region 14 and take a look at what that bracket looks like. This is Clear Fork and Clear View at the top. Uh, at the bottom, the team I would be concerned with is the Shelby Whippets, and the reason is the Shelby Whippets gave up a total of 54 points this year. Uh, nobody scored more than 14 against them. They had four shutouts. Three teams uh, scored just a single touchdown in there. The Shelby Whippets, uh, they are very, very talented. That would be the team I would be most concerned with. In our area, however, and a matchup in week two, should it occur, would be St. Mary's and the team we know as Sparta Highland. Sparta Highlands 8-2. They lost week one to Bloom Carroll by a point. They lost in week 10 to Galleon Northmore 34-12. However, if you're looking at, at their schedule, they defeated just one team that made the playoff. That's Danville, 26 to nothing. And Danville is a Division 7 team. They came out of the Knox Morrow Conference. And uh, so a, a big challenge, of course, for St. Mary's. We know how they like to run the football and an interesting thing for them coming up this week as well. On the other side, let's go to the Division 5 and let's first of all look at Region 18, where Eastwood is the number one seed. They're 10-0 in our area. It's Indian Lake and Archibald. Now, that game has been moved to Defiance High School. Mark, you and I have found several teams now mm -hmm. that are moving their home game because they played Week 10 and got mm -hmm. chewed up in the rain. So this game will be played at Defiance High School. Indian Lake is 7-3, and three. Um, coming off a year in which Dave Coburn graduated so many good players out of his, con off his team from a year ago. Central Buckeye Conference Mad River Division champions, led by quarterback Clay Jacobs, who threw for 1,685 yards and 13 scores. 50 of those catches went to, Will Col to Colin Coburn, name sound familiar, mm -hmm. 725 yards and 8 scores for him. Connor Dixon is their running back. 
He rushed for 221 yards, 1,221 yards, and 14 scores. Uh, Archibald, a couple of tough losses on their 8-2 season, a one-point loss to Liberty Benton in four overtimes last Friday night. You playing four overtimes last Friday night in the weather? Wow. No, I play one. You can have the game after that. <laughs> but they lost to Swan 33-27. Uh, did uh, the uh, Archibald lost to Swan in week 10, so they're 8-2. That's a matchup that we'll cover this week. Likewise, let's move to Division 5, Region 20. In that division, we're looking at the Anna Rockets. They play the Middletown Madison Hawks. The Hawks' losses came in Week 2 and in Week 3 um, to Division 3, Monroe 27-13, and Valley View, who's by 32-7. They've won seven in a row since that time. This will be Madison uh, Hawks' 11th time in the playoffs, but the first since 2015. We've seen Anna, Mark, we know how they are, the two-headed running backs of Hules Camp and Ensley, the quarterback Travis Meyer, the great wide receiver punter Austin Fote. Then they're led on defense by Ethan Bird, Luke Cantrell, Malachi Minnick. Um, this is a very interesting thing we got coming up uh, for the Anna Rockets and the Middletown Madison Hawks. All right, now we're going to look at Division 6, Region 22. We'll put that bracket up there, and we're going to see our local team is number 8 seed Ada. They are at seven and three, and they get to go play the number one seed, Liberty Benton, number one. Not too far away, but they didn't play each other, and so this should be a good game. Ada pass game with Conley to Sumner. We talked about that at Stat Stuffers almost a whole year. They hook up just about nine times per game, and they've thrown 14 touchdown passes, obviously Conley to Sumner 14 times. So the pass game is very important to Ada, but Will the weather affect it? Maybe Conley's going to have to run it a lot more. Of course, Liberty Benton, we talked about them being the league champions up there in the BVC. And Mark mentioned Austin uh, May, May being the, yeah. the player of the, week, the year in that conference. They have great players and 9-1. and one. They are tournament tested. They play a good schedule, and this should be a great game. But the weather will definitely affect affect what Ada wants to do. Yeah, and Ada, of course, needs to be able to throw the football uh, to be successful. they got to keep things honest for Liberty Benton, so that's, that's a good thing for them. Let's go to the same division, and let's look this time at Region 24 with the number one seed. And lots of teams in this area, in our particular area, in this particular tournament. Lima Central Catholic, 9-1. and one. They're averaging 38.7 points per game in those nine wins. They play the Dayton Christian Warriors who I believe this is their first time in the tournament. And, Mark, that can always be a challenge right there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's all hyped. Everybody's excited and ready to go. And then all of a sudden it's Friday night and you got to play. So they have lost once to the Bethel Bees, 45-15. That's the team that Coldwater plays if you look down at the bottom of the next line in that particular bracket. Dayton Christian comes out of the Metro Buckeye Conference. They score 40.6 points a game. They give up 12.1. And again, for Coach Ken Moyer, they beat only one team that had a winning record. That was Cincinnati Lachlan. Uh, they're in the tournament. They're going to match up with Lima Central Catholic. You look down at uh, the bottom part of the bracket where we have Marion Local and Fort Recovery. Uh, the two teams out of the MAC, of course, they played in week number eight. Marion Local won 21 10. Uh, Marion Local had 200 yards rushing that game, 164 yards through the air, total of 300, 364 yards. Fort Recovery just 4 of 11, throwing the ball that night for 31, 39 yards, and they will have to do better this particular week if they want to try to get past the Marion Local Flyers. We know about Bruns, we know about Habitats, we know about Brining, the, the uh, running backs over there. Just another great Tim Goodwin team. Yep. We've talked about Holman many, many times this year. How about Andrew Stocker? Andrew has a career record of uh, 24 sacks. That's a school record there at Fort Recovery. Should we run down Holman once again? How about oh, this? Boy. What do you have, 405 Five. whatever yards the other night? Set a school record against St. Henry. 2,267 yards rushing on the season, 22 scores. He has 5,249 career rushing yards, does Will Holman. And that's an interesting matchup right there. And then to Division 6, Region 24, that's the Spencerville and Mechanicsburg. Mark, you've covered Chris Summers before. They started out with seven turnovers in their first two games, a loss to Lima Central Catholic, a loss to Parkway. But then they turned it around when they got Chris Picker healthy and they got everybody running the ball better, taking care of it better. Mechanicsburg, they lost to two 10-0 teams. They lost to Greenville 17-14, West Jefferson 21 to nothing. The nobody else has scored more than 14 points against them. This team is tournament tested. They lost to Marion Local a year ago out of the Ohio Heritage Conference 14 times in the playoffs, including five in a row for Mechanicsburg. And then finally, Coldwater. And when was the last time we saw the Coldwater Cavaliers as the number four seed at seven and three? 
Uh, they come in with losses to Clinton, Massey, Marion Local, and Delta St. John's last week. That's the loss that put St. John's into the playoffs. A little bit unusual for Colwater. They average just 21 points a game. They give up a little over 14. Tip City Bethel, they come out of the Cross County Conference. They've had eight games of scoring more than 50. Big offensive matchup there in, uh, in that week. Coldwater having trouble scoring points, yeah. but defense wins in playoffs, so maybe they're, they're and there, and tuned up for it. They've certainly been there a lot. Yeah, been there many times. They know what it's all about. they got the fan base and everything else. That's right. Let's look at Division 7 now. In Region 26, you'll see all kinds of local teams. Let's look at the number 8 seed, Wayne Trace, right at the top there. They're 6-4, and four, going to play at Norwalk St. Paul, who finished at 10-1, and one, got the number 1 seed. Coach Mike Spies over at Wayne Trace, they were 6-1 and one and lost their last three games. So you talk about momentum build, building to take you into the playoffs. They're going to have to go the other direction. They're going to have to find some momentum. Norwalk, good playoff tradition. They were the state champs in 2009. We remember recently they had some great battles with Marion Local down there in the state tournament. But uh, Wayne Trace gets a chance to play against the number one seed. Go on down and you'll see Lipsick and Macomb. Number seven seed, Lipsick at seven and three. Macomb's at number two at eight and two. This is a week six, uh, six rematch. Macomb won that game 26 to 14. Lipsick, they have a running game by committee. They got three guys over 300 yards on the season. Pretty even matchup if you just look statistically. Macomb, they're the co-champs of the BVC. They got a new quarterback in week eight, and then the running game became more of an emphasis. And the statistical, or the stat page said 804 yards in penalties this season. I don't know if that was a misprint, yeah. but if so, that's a bunch. That's, that's a 80 bunch. per game, yep. so they're going to have to clean that up to beat a good Lipsick team. The last uh, team we're going to look at in this particular region, Pandora Gilboa, number three. They got a home game. They're sitting at eight and two. Number six, Sycamore Mohawk, coming in at eight and two. Mohawk is just south of Tiffin. Uh, Pandora Gilboa's offense, 35.3 a game, and you mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. How they're just about a 50-50 split between yep. run and pass. 1,914 yards rushing, 1,900 even passing. Their defense has caused 21 turnovers. Offensive balance and defensive turnovers equal success in the playoffs. If PG can keep that going, they should get a win over Mohawk. And a good chance to get a BVC out to the regional finals there, the way that, that particular bracket's drawn up. All right, well, let's move on there to Region 28 in Division 7. Let's kind of go through this. And once again, it's stacked with teams from our area. Crestview, the number one seed, they're 9-1. and one. Their only loss was to Spencerville, 49-34. We know about their quarterback, Drew Klein. He was the player of the year offensively in their conference last year as a quarterback, and one would think he might well repeat in that particular area again. If there's a negative for Crestview, they give up a lot of points. Columbus Grove scored 13. Wayne Trace scored 13. The other eight teams scored at least 21 points against them, and they got to find a way to, to shore up their defense a little bit to go deep in the tournament. And Sonio started one and four, then they won five straight after that, but the teams they beat had a combined record of 10 and 40. They get into the, uh, to the tournament and they get a chance to play number one seed, Crestview. Then number two, Lehman Catholic against Perry, two teams out of the Northwest Central Conference. Lehman, of course, was the champion in the conference. They defeated Perry 49-13 back in week nine. Um, 16th time they're in the playoffs for Dick Roll. Fifth time in a row for them. Perry, how about the season the Commodores have had? Luke Taviano's first season for the Perry grad. They were 3-7 and seven a year ago. This is the first time Perry's had a winning season since 1989, and their first time in the playoffs in the tournament ever. And certainly good luck to the Commodores in a rather difficult situation for them. But they're in the tournament. And then Dolphin St. John's with that win last week. They get a home game since they defeated Coldwater 12-7. They will play Riverside, who was 6-4, and 5-2 and two for Tim McGill in his eighth season. Uh, Todd Shorty in his 19th year, his team scores 26.7 points per game. They give up about 21 points per game offensively. Uh, Riverside scores at 29, and they give up 18. Um, this is an interesting matchup all the way around, Mark. From two different conferences, they don't play each other, and sort of that's kind of an interesting matchup to begin with. Riverside did lose two out of their last three to Perry and to Lehman, so we'll see if they can get it going into the tournament as they match up with Delphi St. John's over there at Stadium Park. And then finally, finally, Minster and Fort Army will match up. Minster out of the MAC at 6-4. and four. They're 4-4. Four and four. At one point, Minster had lost four games in a row, including a one-point loss to Coldwater, but they won their last three wins over New Bremen, Versailles, and then Anna last week in the game that you and I did 20-7. Fort Laramie started six, uh, two and two, then they won six in a row during that particular time period. 
uh, out of their last uh, six games. The only team that had a winning record during that time period was Ansonia, who was 6-4. and four. They give up 42 points a game, but they've had uh, 42 shutouts, uh, 42 points a game in those last six games with four shutouts on the season. They score at 39 points a game. Minster defeated Fort Laramie 20 to nothing in the opener of the season. However, Fort Laramie twice was inside the five-yard line and didn't score. Tackles made by that quarterback at Minster. <laughs> the quarterback had a couple of big hits late in the he game and, defense, and, and yeah. say, yeah, he's a, he's a good defense player. He's a quarterback, and he's a good quarterback. So Jared Hillsman's the man we're talking about. The running back, of course, for Minster is Isaac Schmeezing, and uh, they just do a great job do they at Minster, and they've recovered from their season, but so has Fort Laramie. An interesting matchup. Fort Laramie also had three interceptions in that first game, so if they can clean things up, that's a really good football game, and I think that's where we're headed when we get to the final broadcast schedule out. Hey, before you leave that Minster Anna thing. Okay. Now, you, you, we've talked on the show about how much we like going down to Anna. It's a yeah. great atmosphere. Right. Great atmosphere. Well, the weather took all of our, almost oh. all of our fun away. <laughs> First of all, they got a, a grassy hill where people put yep. lawn chairs. They're not sitting in lawn chairs in that pouring rain, so we didn't see any of that. Then the train, sometimes it stops. This time, pshoo, yep. it just kept right on going. Five times. And the last thing is, no, no rocket, rocket dog. dog. Yeah, I know. Did we did not get a rocket dog. We voted whether to walk across and get the rocket dog or not, but we thought it would be soggy by the time we got it back yeah. to the press box, yeah. and, and we voted not to do that. Well, but, you know, isn't playoff football fun? It is. I mean, you, you yeah. work all year long. This is the... The, the, the gift that you get at the end of it, and you go play. If you get a home game, the fans are excited. But it really is about playing solid defense and taking care of the football. And we see a lot of our local teams do that all year long. So hopefully yeah. we'll have good success like we always do. Well, I'm an old basketball guy, and old is a key word in that. But I never did any conditioning during the, during the tournament. We're not running right now. If we're not in shape now, we're not yeah. going to be in shape. Right. We're going to practice Plus for an hour. Injury you want to heal exactly. Yeah. We're going to practice for an hour. We're going to get after it and go play. Right. Well, Ben Reif and our crew have been working very hard to put together a playoff schedule for not just football, but for lots of other stuff that are going on this week. There's Sandusky and Elida in a soccer game this week. That's a big deal. And then we got Fort Laramie and Rushi volleyball coming up. That's a regional tournament there as well, along with Jackson Center and New Bream, a couple of big volleyball games. And then here's where we're at football-wise this week, Fort Recovery and Mary Local. Ada and uh, Liberty Benton, you and I will be at Fort Laramie Minster. We're also going to get Perry and Lehman Catholic on. Make sure you check the site if you're headed out for a game this week. Some of them have been switched away from home venues because the fields have gotten away from us. And enjoy that playoff Marion football. Local game is at Wapaka. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We, we just found that out before we came on to the air today. Marion Local game will be at, uh, at Wapak this week because of the field conditions. Right. Well, Mark, we're done with our playoffs, and now it's time to get on the field and play. We hope you enjoyed it. You've been watching High School Football on WOSN.